What's up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Flipping Bats. This is going to be a fun one. Manager Joe Madden broke the curse with the Cubs. So many great years in Tampa. Now he is writing a book with our own Tom Berducci called The Book of Joe, Trying Not to Suck at Baseball and Life. So going to talk to Joe all about the book and all about his career, his most exciting memories, managing a talent like Shohei Otani, Albert Pujols, Mike Trout. This is going to be a lot of fun. The playoffs have just gotten underway, so stay tuned for so much more, including if you haven't listened to our Thursday episode from yesterday, go listen to it. It was great. A full playoff preview, everything you need to know, and a season recap as well with some fun awards. The Flippy Awards are in there, so a bunch of awards given out. So that was a fun episode. This one is going to be great as well. We all know him. We've all come to love him. He's done it in his own way, which is really cool, and he talks about that as well. So um, let's get to it now and talk to manager, World Series champion, Joe Matt. All right, and I am pumped to be joined now by World Series champion, Joe Madden. Joe Madden, thank you so much for joining me, my friend. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on here, man. This is uh, quite a, a pleasure. I didn't know you were going to be sitting there like that, so it's great to see you again. <laughs> of, of course. So let's let's talk about this book that you have coming out first and foremost, The Book of Joe, Trying Not to Suck at Baseball and Life. Joe, one, how did this how did this come to be? You wrote it with Tom Verducci. What yeah. went behind the process of you saying, I want to write a book? It's a great title, isn't it? Um, what happened <laughs> was, I mean, it started in 2008 when I was with the Rays. We go to the World Series. A lot of people asked me at that time. I didn't think, nah, it's not the right time to write a book. I didn't. I really haven't done a whole lot. So I wanted to wait a little bit longer post World Series with the Cubs. And then after 2019, 2019, when uh, uh, I was let go there, um, talked to Tommy and they said, listen, I'd like to do this now. I think it's the right time to do a book. So we decided yes. And then here came the pandemic. So I rode my bike literally for, I think it was 90 out of hundred days during that time, during the pandemic break. And I recorded, I had a little Sony dictaphone mic pinned up here. And I just rode in Arizona in an RV park, at least an hour or so every day. It was hot. It was great. And I found what I found is that I think much better on the move. I've always I like to stand up in a dugout. I don't like to sit down. I don't think really well sitting down, although I'm sitting down right now. So I guess I'm not thinking well, but I, I like movement. I like movement. I think movement uh, spurs. And uh, that's what I did and put it together on a daily basis. Tommy would uh, get my stuff, call me back, write me back and just try to get me to dig down a little bit more deeply. And that's exactly the process. And then he weaved his magic. He's outstanding. And that's what you got there. So, one, I guess well, an easy question that comes to mind for me is you're with the Rays for so many years. You went one year from one of the, the worst record in baseball to the World Series the next year. Then then you end up in Chicago with the Cubs and you break the curse of the Billy Goat 108 years. You win a World Series there. So, Joe, what is the key to not sucking at baseball in life? Uh, it's uh, There's a lot of process involved. I mean, for me... I don't want to get too weird or technical, but the moment you walk in the door, you got to start building relationships and you got to start trusting one another and you got to start exchanging ideas. And then, and then you know, at that point right there, then you got to be maybe a little bit constructively critical of one another, grow some thicker skin so we can really arrive at some conclusions here. So it's about culture building. And that's what I'm describing to you right there is my method, my thoughts regarding how to build a culture. I'm saying in a, in a baseball sense, although, like this book, for this book, I'd, I'd like to believe it works outside of our game too. But that's what it is. You, if you, you have to arrive at communication, relationships, trust, all these things have to be embedded before cutoffs and relays or batting practice or how are we going to pitch to somebody. And everybody just wants to jump right there. But you got the, the part I'm talking about is much more difficult than the other side. What was the writing process like for you? Did you enjoy it? Was it oh, tedious? Yeah. Like, how was it? No, it was uh, fascinating. Uh, it's something I've, I've, I've been an avid, voracious reader since 1975. I've, I've been, can't even tell you how many books I've read. My favorite author, I'll tell you, is, there was, is Pat Conroy. I mean, he's no longer with us, but Pat Conroy was my guy. But, um, you know, I've never done anything like this. And so professionally, the publishing company 12 with Sean Desmond and then Dave, David Black, the literary, literary agent, and of course, Tommy. Gosh, they, they made it interesting and easy. The point is, 
uh, you have everybody has thoughts, right? You have, you have all these different things going on in your head and you have some, everybody's got a story. Uh, the, their, their method of making me drill down or think more deeply, that's the part that was fascinating to me because it's easy to chronologically remember what I had done. Even a song will tell me exactly where I was back in the day. But then you got to go a little bit more deeply than that to really try to extrapolate what, what was going on here. What were you thinking right here? And that's what these guys did really well. So cathartic kind of a thing where you just really get a deep dive going on. Whoa. And, and the fact that it was during the pandemic, we had nothing else going on. Nothing. So it's totally dedicated to this endeavor. And that really helped. Yeah, it helps. It helps get it done for sure. It helped a lot of people focus on certain things that they really wanted to get done. And it seems like this turned out to be the perfect time for you. Joe, yeah. is your goal, do you want to manage again? Or is your goal to ride off in the sunset, making a billion dollars with your best selling book and ride <laughs> off into the sunset forever? Very cool. Uh, that's That sounds very cool. But no, I still got that thing going on. You know, I, I would like to manage again. Uh, but again, it, it's got to be under the right circumstances, you've been, I'm sure you read. And then also I've been doing a lot of different interviews. I just, I want analytics to be put back in its place to serve baseball, not baseball to serve analytics. I need a, a front office that I could work with in that regard where coaches are empowered once again. Um, the, the information, the, the information highway, I want it. Absolutely, I want it. But the group that is uh, accumulating this information then has to answer to coaches and not the other way around. It's really become skewed. It's really a bad process. Um, and people become deceived and think teams win because of analytics. They win because of analytics because of their acquisitional process. The teams that acquire better players win. It's that simple. The numbers to a bad team before the game don't mean anything. So a lot of this stuff is not represented properly, I don't think. Uh, but if I could get together with the, with the group that really wants to put baseball first, supplement it with a tremendous analytical team, I'd be very interested. I feel like years ago, analytics weren't a big part of it. And then we went through a stretch of time where it was all analytics. And I feel like we're in a really interesting place right now where teams and organizations are starting to realize, for lack of a better word, this is a great baseball word, you need some feel in the dugout. Yep. You need a manager with some feel. And it feels like mm -hmm. some organizations understand that, others are still a little bit behind. But from when you first came into the league as a manager to now, how has the process of being a manager changed? A lot. I mean, uh, and I, I hate to use the word, but it's interference. Um, I mean, when I first began, even as an interim manager, uh, Billy Bavese was the GM at that time. And I'm the interim guy, right? And we were talking to Billy and our good friends. They said, listen, I don't need anybody in my office one hour before the game. I need to get ready for the game. Quite frankly, all the information that was given to us was stuff that I gleaned from a stat sheet or uh, Matty Keo was the advanced scout. Now, listen, inexact, absolutely. We weren't perfect by any means. We were, we were lacking the, the large sample size. I get that. But um, it, was, it was a pure form of doing business. And I'm saying I would take all of that. I would take that stat sheet. I want an analytical team. I don't want to just scout the team that we had just played or going to play. I want to scout every game. Absolutely. But you have to be able to combine that, put it together. And now you're going to get the, I think, the, the method that is most appealing to me is absolutely getting information uh, put together in, a, in an easy, digestible manner, and then permit baseball people to do baseball things, because that's not what's been going on. It's really been overtaken on the other side. Uh, it started, um, I'd say about five, seven or eight years ago, I think it really became more uh, in tune and uh, it's become less and less appealing. You said feel is the gift of experience, wisdom, and naturally not being sought right now. Yeah, absolutely agree there. And you talk about uh, you talk about this a lot in your book. I'm really excited to read it, by the way. I'm going to have to get myself a copy. Um, so you, you talk well, about you don't that. Have you one. We about, definitely get you one. We'll get you one. Yeah, man. I, I, I need one of those for sure. And, and okay. you also talk about a lot of the, the greats and the game that you've had the pleasure of managing. Albert Pujols, Hugh Darvish, Chris Bryant. And even as recently as this year, Mike Trout, Shohei Otani. Um, but the most interesting of those, probably I would imagine the most difficult to manage would be Shohei Otani. Talk about the process of managing a player and a talent like Shohei. I'm going to tell you this is one of the easiest guys I've ever had to work with. First of all, we had to come to terms or grips with last, not this year, but the previous year that he's going to pitch and play and, and hit, right? 
Now, it seems very obvious right now, but believe me, leading into that moment when we did it, it was not very obvious to a lot of people. And a lot, uh, you can't do this. Why would you even try to do this? You're going to injure the guy and so forth and so on. So what I did in spring training of 2021, we sat down, he and I and Perry sat down and said to him, you, there are no rules. The rules, the, what I want, the policy I want is that on a daily basis, you and I talk. So every day before the next day, he and I would speak about what he wanted to do tomorrow. And if he needed a day, he got it. If he thought he was good, he was good to go. He conveyed to me the only part he was concerned about was his legs. And that if his legs were to get tired, that would be concerning. I said, you got it, man. I said, because I don't know how your legs feel. So you tell me when the legs are not good and you got that day. If you don't want to hit the day that you pitch, tell me. If you don't want to play the day, day before or after, tell me. But it got to the point he got into such a groove with his prep that he never wanted a day off. And the days that he did play, he wanted to run. He wants to steal bases. So the guy's a totally different animal. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it coming down the pike. And he makes it really, really easy to work with him. Was there ever a moment for you, because you were with him from the beginning in his major league baseball career once he came over, was there a moment for you that you remember thinking, this guy's going to be a superstar? Oh, yeah. Uh, even when I, my first year there was 2020, and he actually had been there. He'd been rookie of the year, and I had not seen all that. When I saw him, he was yeah. not good. He wasn't swinging the bat well. He wasn't throwing well. There was nothing really good about his game at that point. So that's when you got to put your scouts cap on. Um, I knew he had done this. If they had shown you it before, they're going to do it again. A lot of old scouts would tell you that, that particular adage. So I didn't get to see it, but you can see the way the body moved. You watch him in batting practice. I didn't see the arm, quite frankly, because he couldn't even hardly throw at that time. Yeah. So I didn't really see that until last year. And he kept building and building. And I watched him recently on, a, on one of the games. Oh, my God. He is... He's among the top, what, five, 10 pitchers in all of baseball right now? Five, yeah. Easily, easily. And, and, and then the top five offensive players in the game also. And I'll tell you another thing. If, we had, if you asked him to play the outfield, no problem, because when Trotty was coming back and he couldn't really play in the outfield, I wanted to put Shoei in the outfield and let Michael be the DH. Those are the kind of things I was thinking about, too, because I know he can do it. And do it well at a high level. If you watch him shag in batting practice, it's gold glove caliber defense. He is that talented. Unbelievable. Uh, another talent that you got to manage, a Hall of Famer, not just a Hall of Famer, first ballot, one of the greatest to ever do it, Albert Pujols, recently hit home run number 700. Joe, one, how pumped were you for him? But two, yep. where were you when Albert Pujols hit home run number 700? Well, I was, I was here in Pennsylvania, I'm in Sugarloaf, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm here since I've been uh, discarded. I've been playing golf every day and having a great time. So I was here and yeah, I mean, I, I listen. I was with Albert very briefly. We had a lot of very good conversations. I have, I've had nothing to do with his success whatsoever. Uh, when he was with the Cardinals, I mean, that's when I worked against him with the Rays, that's when it began. And of course, what he did with the Angels, it's an extraordinary talent. And we're talking about Shohei and Shohei's genius is that he can do both. But with Albert, Albert, so people don't understand, this is a really great baseball player. They're just going to look at him as a home run hitter. Superb first baseman. Great throwing arm. Not fast, but ran the base as well. Mentally, um, obviously, could be a coach manager, whatever he wants to be, because he thought the game through so well. See, these are the things that are never spoken about. When you're with the guy, his baseball acumen is off the charts. So that's the kind of stuff that really impresses me about a baseball player. It's like Aaron Judge right now. Aaron Judge is a great baseball player. I was, I'm so rooting for the Triple Crown. But people just want to recognize homers and, of course, uh, deservedly so with Albert. But this guy is a really, really good baseball player. We need more of them. Yeah, and I agree with you. I thought it was cool the other day when Aaron Judge was asked, what's cooler to you, the higher average or all the home runs? And he said batting average. And a lot of people want to write off batting average in the game of baseball today. But to hear him say that was really cool, I thought. Joe, you, you've experienced so much in your days, a long time in the minors and then a long career in the majors, World Series, and all of this is, is talked about in your book. Do you have one part of the book or a chapter that you are most excited for people to read and to get to know or a part that you're just most excited about in the book? Well, I mean, it has nothing to do with baseball in a sense. And I don't know, I can't remember exactly where it's located, but it's the moment I sat next to that lady on the airplane. 
flying from uh, Phoenix to Midland, Texas, and I was absolutely distraught. I think it's in the beginning, right, front, right up front. Um, I had been passed over for a coaching job. I had been running the minor league system. I was the coordinator, the hitting coach, the catching coach, the base running. I was all of these different things, and I thought I deserved an opportunity. And I was passed over uh, by Doug Grader for Jeter Hines, who was a really good friend and still is. But the point was, I, I, was, I felt hurt you know, at that particular time that I did not get this opportunity. So I'm, I'm shutting it down, which I never do. And I was like really upset and I wasn't coaching well. So I got on an airplane to go to Midland to be the hitting coach. I was a hitting coach for the whole minor league system. And I'm, I'm just in the middle seat and I'm, I'm upset. And all of a sudden this lady wanted to talk. And at one point she just said to me, remember one thing, whatever you put out there comes back to you. And I took out my head, like, headphone and I said, what? Uh, would you mind repeating that? She told me that just changed. I swear to God, when I heard her say that, my whole attitude changed. Whatever you put out there comes back to you. You put out negative vibes, negative vibes come back to you. You put out positive, you're going to get that back in return. I got off that plane in, in Midland, and I was like reborn again. And, and that was a lesson learned because I've thought that phrase, and I've thought about that moment a lot since then. So of all the seminal moments, of all the moments in that book that people might enjoy, that one to me resonates because I could, I could just see myself sitting there. I could see this lady there and how it changed my attitude immediately. That's incredible. The book of Joe, trying not to suck at baseball and life. Joe, when does it finally get released? Where can we find it? Tell us all that information. Yeah, it's uh, October 11th release date. I know for sure if you go on Amazon, uh, you, could, you could pick up a copy of that. I'm sure the other outlets are also available bookstores too, uh, but the, the most of the, the early releases occurred on Amazon. Um, I really, I, I'm, I'm really proud of it. I, I think, I mean, I know Verducci is outstanding. He's an outstanding writer. He took what I said and he augmented it and substantiated it. And the research that he did, I, to me, was absolutely stellar. So uh, I hope you all enjoy it. Um, there was a lot going into it. It's really pretty much the premise was comparing and contrasting managers from the 80s to present time. And then uh, a little bit more um, a, a deep dive or depth into what's going on in baseball today. Wow, that's really awesome. I'm excited to read it. Um, our own Fox Sports, Tom Verducci and Joe Madden, the book of Joe. Joe, I'm pumped for that and so excited that you came on. I really appreciate it, my, th my friend. Thanks for hopping on with me. And thank you for asking. I really appreciate that a lot. Be well. Of course. All right, I just wanted to thank Joe Madden for joining me. What a brilliant baseball mind. I do hope he's back in baseball soon managing because that is what Joe Madden is meant to do. But in the meantime, you got to check out his book. Thank you so much to him for joining me, uh, for talking about this book, The Book of Joe, Trying Not to Suck at Baseball and Life, which is something we should all try not to do, really. So congratulations to our own Tom Verducci and to Joe Madden for getting this book put together. It comes out October 11th. Make sure y'all check that out. That was really fun for me to talk to him and, and hear about his managing days. I've obviously watched him from afar for so many years, seeing him with the Rays and then the Cubs and then the Angels to manage so many of the great players that he did to be able to talk to him about that, as well as his book was really cool. So I hope you all enjoyed this Friday episode of Flippin' Bats. Um, be ready. The playoffs, we are going hard during all of this. We will be going live after so many of these playoff games. Saturday night will be live. All the post-game analysis, all the previews will be going live after the majority of days throughout the playoffs. So be on the lookout for that. Thank you all for listening to this one. Make sure you're subscribed wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever it may be, and follow along on all social media so you don't miss anything. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and you can watch every single episode on YouTube as well at Flippin' Bats Pod for all of them. I hope you all appreciated and enjoyed this conversation. Make sure you check out his book, and I will see you tomorrow night for a live recap of the playoffs. We are underway in October. Let's go. I will see you next time. What's up, kinfolk? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. I am Fox College Football Analyst, here to tell you about the number one ranked show podcast. Each week, I sit down with coaches, players, and legends of the game for a unique conversation about all things college football and recruiting. Plus, I share my perspective on the top storylines from Saturday and react to the college football playoff rankings. Subscribe to the number one ranked show with RJ Young on Apple Podcasts, 
Spotify, or your favorite podcast app.